This is a Tibet House member video and is a part of the Force for Good class series, now available at tibethouse.us. Here are a couple of my favorite descriptions of mindfulness, which I hope you, I hope they'll speak to you. The first one is from um, a book by a woman named Lynn Tillman <clears throat> called What Would Lynn Tillman Do? It's a, she's a cultural critic or something. It's a collection of her essays. And it's a little piece called At the Microphone. At a conference called Schizo Culture, held at Columbia University in 1975, the speakers were magnetic and illustrious. William Burroughs, R.D. Lang, John Cage, all people influenced by Buddhism, actually. The audience, graduate students, artists, writers, and freelance intellectuals. Later on, Schizo Culture, organized by Sylvain Lautringer, would be billed as the conference that launched French theory, especially Foucault, in America. The gathering took place in a lecture hall or auditorium that seated about 300 people, a raucous and animated group, who heard, for instance, about psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan and were told that the unconscious is structured like a language. R.D. Lang said that graduate students were the most depressed population in any society. <laughs> All day, men, no women, took the microphone and spoke. There was always a buzz in the audience, whispers, an audible hum of excitement. Then it was time for John Cage. He walked onto the stage and began to speak without the microphone. He stood at the center of the small stage and addressed the crowd. He talked without, ampli without amplification. And soon people in the audience shouted, we can't hear you, use the mic, we can't hear you. John Cage said, you can if you listen. Everyone settled down. There was no more buzz, hum, or rustling. There was silence. And John Cage spoke again, without the microphone. And everyone listened and heard perfectly. So he's, see, I think, if, if we have time, I'll get to it later. I think John Cage was one of the, um, the first people in the West to, re to introduce mindfulness you know, without calling it mindfulness, without directly um, channeling his Buddhist teachers. But he managed to turn it into something in his music, in his art, and, and he was completely devoted to communicating the concept in, you know, through a million maneuvers like this one. So what could he do to get people to access that quality of mind? You know, simply listen. Freud talked about it, you know. Uh, in psychoanalysis, simply listen and don't bother about keeping anything in mind. That was his instruction to psychoanalysts about how to practice. So he was on to it too, actually. Um, this, is from, this is from a book called Buddhism and Psychoanalysis, which edited by a psychologist at the New School named Jeremy Safran. And um, it's just the very beginning of the book, the epigraph that he, that he put at the beginning. The, the book is a uh, a compilation of dialogues between uh, Buddhist-influenced psychoanalysts and Buddhist teachers. And um, uh, between, yeah, I think that's what it was. Uh, anyway, he was trying to get at what the, um, I think it was, anyway, I won't get into it. Um, but this is the epigraph at the beginning of the book where he's uh, speaking, telling a personal story. My Tibetan teacher, Karma Tinley Rinpoche, once asked me in his broken, heavily accented English, how does Western psychology treat nervousness? Why do you ask, I responded. <clears throat> well, he replied, I've always been a nervous person. Even when I was a little boy, I was nervous, and I still am. Especially when I have to talk to large groups of people or to people I don't know, I get very nervous. As was often the case with the questions that Karma Tinley asked me, I found myself drawing a complete blank. Part of it was the difficulty of trying to find the words to explain something to somebody whose grasp of English was limited. But there was another more important factor. 
On the face of it, this was a simple question. But Karma Tinley was a highly respected Lama, now in his 60s, who had spent years mastering the most sophisticated Tibetan meditation techniques. Those who knew Karma Tinley considered him to be an enlightened being. In the West, psychotherapies are increasingly turning to Buddhist meditation as a valuable treatment for a variety of problems, including anxiety. Who was I to tell him how to deal with anxiety? And how was it possible that Karma Tinley, with all of his experience meditating, would still be troubled by such everyday concerns? How could an enlightened person be socially anxious? Was he really enlightened? What does it mean to be enlightened? My head swirled with all of these questions, and for a moment my mind stopped. I felt a sense of warmth coming from Karma Tinley, and I felt warmly towards him. I felt young, soft, open, and uncertain about everything I knew. So I, you know, when I, I got the book, he wanted me to blurb the book, and I got the book, and I read that, and I called him up right away. I don't know him. I called him up right away, and I said, that's like so beautiful. I love that thing. And he said, oh, my editor wanted me to, to keep it out because uh, they thought it would confuse people. Do you, 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 you don't find it confusing, right? Okay. But that quality, that young, soft, open, and uncertain about everything I know, that's it. Like when you practice mindfulness, that's the quality to remember. You know, that's the, there's like a, um, the posture of mindfulness when you're placing it before you. You know, like the yoga posture when you're, when you're doing, when you're doing uh, physical yoga. That's, the, that's where you want to be coming from as much as possible. Like that place of uncertainty and vulnerability and openness and really not knowing. Because the, the ex experience, even of just watching your breath moment to moment, is literally you don't know what the next moment is going to bring. You know, that's like actually we're sitting, when we met, we're sitting at this, you, you know, on this uh, fulcrum of, of the present moment, which doesn't even exist. You know, there's no such thing as a present moment. It's like you can turn around and look behind you and see it, it, things slipping away, or you can look in front of you and see it emerging, you know? But it's like a, a constant stream of, oh, we really don't know what's coming next, but here it is, you know? So that's the, that, it's this kind of opening, 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 expanding of the, this quality that we all share, which is just the simple ability to be aware. Thanks for watching, and please be sure to like and subscribe to support the ongoing work of Tibet House US. Tashi Delek.